Later this week, we're going to have a bunch of people. We're going to have um, Hope Honek. We're going to have Will Tuttle. We're going to have David Simon. Uh, we were going to have Richard Oppenlander, but we have all their books. And basically what they're saying is eating animals is the worst of everything. It uses the most carbon, uses the most water, uses the most land, cuts down the most trees. Um, all the poop from the animals creates dead zones, and there's a list that goes on. And so what they're saying is, listen, there's a lot of things you could do, but the number one thing that a single individual person could do immediately is stop eating animal products completely for all these reasons. Um, now, you, you address that that alone is not going to be the solution enough, but does this seem like on your list, you know, according to Richard Oppenlander's book, up to, he's saying that 51% of all greenhouse gases comes from the raising of animals. I won't try to explain how we got to that number, but does this seem to you like this belongs on the list very high up as uh, another very important step to take, even if you yourselves don't eat this way? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, a, it's a great question, but you know, I, like all the statistics, and somebody did show me that statistic today, you have to be very careful what it's saying. 51% of, I mean, I don't think that's, that may be of agriculture or, or domestic uses, but it doesn't count power plants or, or uh, vehicles or making cement. Or, okay, but so how you, how you define that, and would it be a good goal to do internationally? Sure. But the other way to look at that is, if I decide to do that, but the planet's still heading where it is, I mean, even if I get a million people to go with me, have you made a dent in the problem, which I think was implied in your, your later comment. So we, we get into this thing of personal commitment, community commitment, if you will, which is important. Like in Miami, the way, the way to look at this is, in Miami, they're concerned about rising sea level, what's happening, they're putting pumps in. And then they're talking about reducing greenhouse gas. And what I've had to explain to people there is that reducing greenhouse gas is a global effect but has no impact on rising sea level in Miami because that's determined in Antarctica, if you will. And so there's a difference in personal commitment, which is really important, an example to wider communities, but then being realistic about this impact you know, globally. So with beef consumption, would it be good to promote it? I mean, or getting off beef? Sure. But is it going to solve the problem? No, as you alluded to. So that's where I think that a balance making sure we see something as a personal action versus a global solution. But you, ha you have to start somewhere. I mean, ultimately, it is an individual decision. It, it's sort of a no-brainer in that it's better for your health, it's better for the planet, and so, yeah. Why not? You want, you want to be smart how you do it. I mean, there's enormous, you're absolutely right, there's an enormous amount of embedded water and, uh, yeah. and, and carbon emissions in that meat. There's no question yeah. about that. But as Helen was alluding to, those, if the strawberries came from halfway around the world, there's a bunch of embedded water and carbon in that too. You want to be, you want to be eating Major. local also. Major. Yeah. Yeah. Always look at where, you, where your stuff comes from in the supermarket. You can, you can grow beans almost any place. Yeah. <laughs> um, Helen, they, if we leave this panel tonight and we say to our friends, you know what, this situation with um, the potential of nuclear war is so serious, the United States has to get completely get out of this mindset and get rid of it. The first thing someone's going to say is, well, if we get rid of it and the other countries have it, then we're going to be in more danger. So what's your response to that? You um, are the model for the rest of the world. Everyone emulates you. You led the nuclear arms race at every step of the way except one, and Russia blindly copied and followed. And because you've got nuclear weapons and developed them first and they're seen as a symbol of power and authority and masculinity, if you will, uh, not security, they're not for security, other countries think the same way. Um, you have to be the model for the rest of the world. If you start to disarm, and you know that's what the Pope's going to start talking about, that's what Jesus would do, then Russia, who really wants to get rid of her nuclear weapons because they're getting rusty and, and very seriously dangerous, she said she'll emulate you. And then you have the moral authority. You have no moral authority to tell anyone that they shouldn't have nuclear weapons, including Iran. You have no moral authority at all. But if you do the right thing, then you, you could go to the United Nations and say, 
We've decided we're going to abolish nuclear weapons in America and we've signed an agreement with Russia that they'll abolish theirs. Only, if, as I've said, Russia and America can destroy life on the planet. Only Russia and America. But then India and Pakistan could be forced to follow. Do you see what I mean? You can become the leaders. In fact, your lifestyle is leading the world now. Um, and so you have to understand your huge moral authority and huge responsibility as Americans towards life on the planet. And you, only if you change, only if you change, will the world change. So, again, there's people of all ages who watch this on video, there's people here. Some people have thought about these things, some have not. If you were gonna give a final statement and they were gonna listen to you, and they, would, you know, they wanted to take action, they were motivated, they were passionate. Helen, you've made it very clear. We should, you're saying, we should understand the dangers of nuclear power and do everything in our power to tell, tell our elected officials to get the heck out of any, to get out, out of the situation when with the Ukraine and Russia, to get away from nuclear um, war, and that this is an urgent, imminent crisis that we're psychically numbing ourselves and not dealing with. So that's one thing that we get, that's great. Yes, and you must become educated. The New York Times is writing absolute rubbish about the, the Ukraine and blaming Putin, uh, like they wrote rubbish about uh, Iraq and published five front page articles by Judith Miller saying that Hussein had weapons of mass destruction and nuclear weapons, which he didn't. She was already sleeping with Scooter Libby at the time. The New York Times instigated and helped to start that dreadful war in Iraq where a million people were killed. So it's doing the same thing again. If you want to really read the truth, read, go to Consortium News and read a journalist called Robert Parry. He spent the last year in the Reagan Library looking at all the papers and finding out some very interesting stuff. But apart from that, he's done really, really good research on what is happening in the Ukraine, the history of the Ukraine, the Nazis who are still there, who are violently anti-Semitic, working with Poroshenko, the now American puppet, and how dangerous it is. Um, and also watch my symposium, The Dynamics of Possible Nuclear Extinction, which you can find on my web page at HelenCaldicottFoundation.org. Educate yourselves, find out, and only then can you become a leader. And each person in this room can be as powerful as the most powerful person who's ever lived. If you get it in your heart and soul, and the passion that will drive you to save the planet and become a true leader, a Joan or John of Arc. So if each of you would, I guess, give us your final instructions, there's people here, if someone was gonna listen to you, if they said, okay, I'm gonna listen. So number one, for, you know, so if I heard what Helen said and someone understands that. So what else would be your, to take your personal lectures you gave and the panel tonight and the panel last night, if you wanted to try as much as it's not easy to articulate, but if you wanted to try to articulate what you want, what we individually should do, the, the most specific step you could think of, you know, I would, you know, one thing you could say is don't eat meat. One other thing you could say is, you know, stop, get, you know, don't tell only elect officials that are against this, this situation in Ukraine. What would be the most specific instructions that you want to leave us with and you want everyone to hear um, if they were going to listen to you? You asked in what you sent us for, I think, a list of 10 things, so I came up with my 10 things. Drive less, walk more, eat organic, eat less meat or no meat, slow down, question technology, reimagine the future and insist that politicians do the same, study science because the distortion of science is something that's very dangerous, uh, the old adage of reduce, reuse, recycle, and um, raise wise children and grandchildren because you are borrowing their planet. Yeah. I've done mine. You guys cheated again. That wasn't one. He said... <laughs> he asked once before for a top ten. I, said. I follow the rules. I'm going to give you one. Um, 
seize the opportunity. That's the one. So um, I think John has said this very poetically, uh, both today and yesterday, that um, it's very easy to be scared and intimidated by the problem that we face and to become very pessimistic. And there are days, frankly, when I wake up and I'm very pessimistic about this. Um, but it's also our greatest opportunity as a, as a species, that we have the biggest challenge we've ever faced and that means we have the biggest opportunity we've ever faced. This is our chance to come together and um, overcome a lot of the, the petty and stupid mistakes we've made up till now and to, uh, to start a new future. Well, um, obviously echoing on that, the, uh, we're going to go through some dark times and I think we're, we're, we can learn and do better coming out of this, but it's going to be refashioning everything about our society. But it comes down to the simplest single metric, as, uh, as Seth alluded to, and we, we, seem, we only met yesterday, but we seem to share a lot of opinions here that we do know that at about 900 parts per million, call it 1,000 parts per million of carbon dioxide, this planet, life is not going to, we will not be part of life here. That we will go through a mass extinction, as has happened six times in the last 500 million years. And we're well on the way. The latest, even the latest IPCC looks at a projection of up to 900 parts per million this century. So if there's a single thing that needs to drive us, it's got to be to reduce greenhouse gases. If this planet gets four or five degrees Celsius, eight or nine degrees Fahrenheit warmer than it in the last, you know, 100,000 years that we've flourished, uh, we, will, we will not be here. So while there are lots of problems, and certainly cows add to greenhouse gas and so on, so all of that ties in, but it's nice to have a single goal. And to me, it's got to be that we have to reduce greenhouse gases. Because if not, this planet will literally cook. And everything else from arts to science to agriculture to uh, you know, world wars and so on are going to be part and parcel of that. So it sounds singular and perhaps myopic, but if there's one metric, if we just let this greenhouse gas climbing straight up as it is, you saw my graph today, you know, it, it, it's vacillated between 180 and 280 over the last 10 million years. It's at 400 and climbing straight up. That needs to be our metric for success. And it can start personally with not eating meat, but it's got to start putting a price on carbon, telling our politicians to do that. And to me, it's an overriding focus. I use sea level rise in the shoreline to get people's attention, but it really comes all around back to we cannot let us be cooked by greenhouse gases that are going to warm this planet that much. Let me close by saying that these people have come from around the world. Helen came from Australia. Everyone flew in. These are experts who have studied, put their time in, Burning written these books. Carbon. If you exactly. are fortunate enough to hear this information, whether live, online, or in the future by video, I hope you will understand that it's probably not an accident that you ran into this information. Again, maybe you are supposed to be much more of a leader than you ever thought you were. Maybe you said, I'm not supposed to be a leader because I wasn't really that great in school. I wasn't really that educated. I don't have a degree. That's what everyone told us. Maybe you are supposed to be the nose cone of the rocket and the leader of your community and the one to educate your friends. And if no one in your community seems that interested, maybe that's because you are supposed to be the leader. You're supposed to take this information. You're supposed to get it to everyone you know, get them to see the videos. And maybe you're supposed to play a much, much bigger role than you ever imagined. And I hope you'll consider doing that.